Lord, you make all things work together for my good. You make all things work together for my Stigma with the Holy Spirit, where people are just like, okay, well, what is it? What does this whole kind of thing mean? And, and how should we act? And how should specifically regarding the gifts of the Holy Spirit? And we said, man, let's just talk about it. Let's have a series where we talk about the Holy Spirit. So we talk about the power of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. We talk about what it means to be being filled by the Holy Spirit. And how we need God's Spirit to live the life He's called us to. And then we jump into the gifts of the Spirit, and we've uh, tackled most, if not all, of, of the gifts. Uh, some of them uh, we spent a little bit more time on uh, than other gifts. And hopefully uh, it's, it's been a blessing for you. I know I've been encouraged as we've gone through this series. Uh, and, and today is our final message in that series. Uh, and we have a special guest pastor who's going to be bringing the word uh, to us. He's a, a, a great friend who has... He served back with Chuck Smith back in Calvary Chapel, uh, Costa Mesa, long ago. Ended up leaving there to plant a church in Cambridge, England, which God did an incredible work. They raised up um, uh, leaders there from their, their church that were English uh, pastors that ended up taking over the church. Ended up moving back here and is now planting a church in the Princeton area of New Jersey called Living Springs Church. And so I'm so pumped for him. Um, he's and God is doing such an incredible work uh, through him uh, and his team. So excited to have him. I've been excited all week to have him, not just because I get kind of a week off where I don't have to kind of pour in uh, very much time to study. Uh, but I've been pumped because I knew um, that getting Joey out here, more than anything, uh, that he would be able to make an incredible spiritual deposit into our lives um, that, that Lord willing will be able to take with us and, and apply uh, that will affect us long after um, he leaves. So, uh, Joey, come on, bro. Uh, that's incredible. Bless you. Bless you. You can take. You can turn it off. You want. Okay, that's great. Well, I'm the one blessed this morning to be able to finally come and just visit with you all since this church planted. I've gotten a chance to get to know Jimmy, and um, 
And I love that his heart is to see new people come to Christ, to see people who have already come to Christ be brought to maturity. And I'm, I'm passionate about seeing believers be all in for Jesus. And I'm passionate about the church being all about Jesus. And I'm really discouraged sometimes at how much the church is not about Jesus so often in these days we live in. And so this last part of the series of A Spirit-Filled Life and to talk about the body of Christ, I'm so privileged and honored because I love the church. And the reason why I love the church so much is because I love Jesus so much. And if you understand where Jesus is today, he's not just seated at the right hand in the throne room of God, but he's seated in the heavenly places, or he's also seated in the heart places with his church. And we have to see that, that he's in the heavenly place and he's in the heart place. He's with us as he dwells us by his Holy Spirit. But we also are with him in the heavenly places. And so what's happening is this convergence between heaven and earth, where one day God is going to take the realities of heaven and it's going to manifest here on earth in fullness. But the church is meant to begin that process. We are the city on a hill. We are the people God has called to be ambassadors for him. And uh, I... I take it so serious to be one who, anytime I open up the Word of God, wants to communicate to you not just the truth of Scripture, but to help you get a clear picture of who this God is and what His will is for our lives, what His heart is for us as the people of God. As Brother Jimmy said, you know, I, I, I have been kind of all over the world a bit with our calling and ministry. We've done three 3,000 mile moves my family and I from California to New Jersey, New Jersey to England, England back to New Jersey. We've had a child in each of the places where I've done ministry. So I have a, my daughter born in California, my son Josiah in New Jersey, and then my youngest son Jordan Caleb who was born in England. And um, so we've kind of come back with a bit of a fresh perspective of what the Lord has taught us over the years about his church. And the first thing I just want to say before we get into our study this morning is that the church is never a building as a noun, as it relates to this kind of a building, but it's a building as it relates to a verb because we are building one another up. And today our biggest need is to get people in the West to wake up and see that church isn't something we go to. It's who we are and, and it's... it's being the church that matters, not going to church. It's not just showing up like you've just done on Sunday, but it's growing up like we do every day. It's learning to be a people who are so committed to Jesus that other people in the world know what you're committed to by the way you live your life. And when we come together, we get to be something that is a community that is supposed to represent something in heaven. And you know what's interesting? Is that before there was anything, before there was creation, God as the creator existed as a community of perfect unity. We call it the triunity or the trinity of God. God is the Father, God is the Son, God is the Holy Spirit. He is one God and yet many or three in one. And you know what's interesting? Everything that God created was meant to actually mysteriously reflect that reality too. For example, when God created Adam, he was also three in one because he was made in the image of God. You say, how was Adam three in one? Well, he was spirit, he was soul, and he was body. And yet there was one Adam. He was, in a sense, a reflection of that triune nature of God. But then not only that, then Adam was put to sleep and out of him came a bride. And so now you have two different distinct beings becoming one in marriage. So you see, God is always working with this theme that there's one, yet many. Uh, there is this unity, yet distinction. There is this mysterious relationship that happens when we start to understand that God's heart was to join with his creation. And marriage is the most incredible picture of that. Because although we understand that we'll never be God, we get to join in the unity of the community of the triunity of God forever and ever, where we're going to be in his presence, where there's the fullness of joy, where in his right hand are pleasures forevermore. And the goal and objective of our church gatherings is to come to the, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, where we are becoming so much like him 
where we'll be a bride fit for him, we'll be united with him, and we'll be entering into the fellowship that has always been for all eternity. If you start to grasp the Christian message in the big picture, and you start seeing what we're gathering for every week and throughout the week and daily living for Jesus, you realize there's never an off day. There's never a bad day to worship the Lord. There's never a day where we're off and then a day where we're on. Every day matters. Every moment matters. Every situation in your life has been ordained by God to get you to see something and to be something that God intends for your life. And in order for us to do that, we have to learn to die to ourself. Our greatest challenge this morning is yourself. I wonder how many of you will be in the way of you receiving your blessing. I wonder how many of us get in the way of us being the church because we don't see things the way God wants us to see them. So my prayer this morning is that God will give you revelation to see things more clearly so that you can be all that God intends for you to be in this particular fellowship of believers and also in the bigger picture of Christ building his church. And so would you open up to the book of Romans chapter 12? And this is where we're going to base our teaching this morning, but we're going to be looking at it quite a few different probably passages of scripture as we journey through this topic. I'm going to talk to you today about how there is one body and yet many members and how we are to function in the fullness as the body of Christ. What does it mean to be an active, healthy body of believers? In Romans chapter 12, Paul begins to write these words. And I'm just going to ask, would you stand with me as we read uh, the first five verses of Romans 12? I want you to stand with me because I just want us to give some reverence in this moment that we are holding the living book where we can take a look at the living God. We are holding the words of life and we want to listen to God's spirit speaking to our hearts in a way of reverence and respect for his authority in our life. And so Paul, writing to the Roman believers, he says this, chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself. Lord, help us in this. Not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. And father, as we read these words and as we come before your presence with expectation, we ask for the teaching of the Holy spirit our helper, our guide to the truth, that we would see you, Jesus, more clearly. We would see you living in the church as the manifest presence of God among your people, that, God, we would understand that to be a part of the church is to be the bride of Christ. And, Lord, because we are one corporate identity, every one of us matters in the preparation of the bride. Every one of us matters in the building up of your church. Every one of us matters as it relates to your will being carried out. If any one of us at any one time are walking less than what we're called to be and do, then the church is that much less than what it's meant to, to be shown as to the world. The visible expression that you want us to be as the church requires each of us to do our part, to see our calling, our heavenly calling, and to be an active participant in what you're doing today in the building of your church. God, I want to pray today that we would just really take in what we hear. But I also want to pray we would become doers of your word and not hearers only. And I pray the prayer that Paul prayed to the Ephesians. That God, you would grant to us the spirit of wisdom 
and revelation in the knowledge of your Son, that the eyes of our understanding may be enlightened and that we might know what is the hope of your calling and what are the riches of the glory of your inheritance in the saints. So speak to us now, we pray. Speak to us personally, practically, and powerfully. We ask this in Jesus' name and for your glory. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Go ahead and grab a seat. So, do you remember a time in Jesus' ministry where in John chapter 12, he used this example that I don't think we've really oftentimes meditated enough on, but it's when he said, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it bears much grain. Now I want you to stop and just think about this for a minute. God's heart is for us to be fruitful and to multiply. Do you know that was the first command given to mankind before sin entered the world? Be fruitful and multiply. Now in the Old Testament, we know they were going to literally physically populate the earth. But in this new covenant, we want to recognize the spiritual reproducing that needs to happen on this earth. And we call it discipleship. Discipleship is where the life of Christ is able to be multiplied and grown in the lives of other people. In order for me to make a disciple, I have to first be a disciple. I can only lead people as far as I've gone or I'm willing to go. So your personal walk with Jesus really matters because let me just say this, your personal walk with Jesus is the means to an end of what you're reproducing. Do you know that there are people this morning who are counting on your devotional life? There are people this morning who are counting on your obedient life? And that your purity actually matters not just to you, but to the people you're going to come in contact with? See, Jesus says, unless the grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, if it actually is put to death inside the soil of the ground, it then can grow up into many grain and much grain and much crop and much fruit, so to speak. And so there's a picture of the way Jesus lived his life. Jesus was the grain of wheat first that went to the ground or went to the cross and died. And out of Jesus came the church. Now, there's a lot I could say about that as a way of mystery, because in case you, well, I'll just throw this out there just for those of you who have never looked at this before. But when God made the woman and made the man, do you notice that he made the man before he made the woman? But did you notice that when he made the woman, he made, it, made her differently than he made the man? Meaning that he took the man out of the dust of the earth and formed him into a man. But then he put man to sleep and out of his side came a bride. Did you know that that was all a foreshadowing of what God would do in the gospel? That Jesus Christ, the new man, the second Adam, the last man, would have to be put to sleep, but not just to sleep, but to death. To take away the sin of the world and out of his side would come a bride called the church. That in the same way that Eve was brought to Adam and he looked at her and said, you're a bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. You shall be called woman because you were taken out of man. Jesus would one day say, well, the spear went into his side, out came blood and water, elements of birth. And there was a bride being formed, the church, that out of Jesus would come a bride fit for him and that we would be born again of the spirit as his bride and that we would be brought to him one day and presented to him as a glorious bride. It, let me just tell you this, the whole Bible all intersects and connects. And what makes the Bible come alive is when we believe so strongly in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that we let Scripture interpret Scripture. See, I believe this, the old is in the new and the new is in the old. Let Scripture interpret Scripture, then read and behold. When you begin to let the Scriptures speak, you start to see things that God will awaken you to make connections of. And one of the things you have to realize is, is that there has to be, ever since sin entered the world, a death in the process for the progress of becoming what God intends for humanity. See, death was never a part of God's original plan because the wages of sin is death. And God didn't intend for sin. At least it was against his will, right? 
But he knew that man would sin, and he knew that he would come to deal with sin, and so he was the savior appointed before the foundation of the world. And the amazing thing is, when Jesus went to the cross, he knew that through his death would come life. It's a principle of spiritual growth. Something has to die in order for more life to flourish. Now, think about this. It's with that context that you need to approach Romans chapter 12. Because in the opening verses of Romans 12, we see Paul saying, Therefore, I beseech you, brethren, after everything he's taught in the first 11 chapters about the call of God and the new man that's in Christ and how Adam brought sin and death into the world, but through Jesus there would be righteousness and redemption and that we would be able to be made alive again. And so he says in chapter 12, verse 1, I beseech you or I urge you, I exhort you, Therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, just stop and think about that. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, let me ask you guys a question. What was the body of Adam like that's different from the body of Adam after he sinned? Was it still fleshly? Was it still physical? Was it still earthly? Yes. But you know what changed? When Adam sinned, his body began a process that made him both mortal and subject to death. Adam became prone to things he was never prone to. Adam had a clock that started ticking on his life once he sinned. And the body that we dwell in right now is that fallen body that we inherited from Adam. One day we know that this tent must be removed so we can go into a permanent dwelling place in our glorified body. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm excited about my glorified body. Because like this one, as I get a little bit older, I already realize some of the changes that are happening with it. But you know what I'm excited about? Is that I actually kind of have a sneak peek of what my new body's gonna be like. Because if you look at the 40 days after Jesus rose again from the dead, you get a sneak peek at what resurrected life looks like. You know what you get to do? You get to think where you wanna be and you're there. Jesus appeared, disappeared, showed up, and then was gone. He wasn't bound by gravitational pulls or by limitations of time, space, and matter. Jesus could just show up and be where he wanted to be. I think that's what it's going to be like in our glorified bodies. Jesus still ate food. Amen? He still ate after he resurrected. He was, he was you know, barbecuing the fish on the side there by the Galilee when the disciples were fishing in John 21. Jesus was able to eat. We're able to eat. We're going to be able to enjoy food, but here's the cool thing. I don't think we're going to be able to get full and get indigestion. I don't think we're going to get to the point where it's going to be like, oh, I shouldn't have eaten that. It's going to be like, no, I should have eaten that. And I ate as much of it as I wanted, and I enjoyed the fellowship of the people around me. Jesus teaches us in the resurrected life, the body is no longer bound by things that we are, are, are now bound to. But what does it mean to present the body you have now as a living sacrifice? Well, let me say this, because I think that in order to understand this, you need to realize that because death is a necessary part of the process now, Jesus once said, if you want to find your life, you must first what? Lose it. But he also adds this, for who, he who loses his life for my namesake will find it. So it's not just losing your life. See, we live in a world where people take their life. Jesus, when he went to the cross, didn't take his life. He gave his life. See, it was a giving away of life for the sake of others. We live in a world where there's so much loneliness and hurt and hopelessness and despair, and it's because people are operating outside of the divine design that God had for humanity. And as a result, there is something missing in the cognitive reality and in the relational reality of what life was meant to be. We're out of alignment. The word obedience is simply about alignment. When you're in alignment with God, you're in obedience. When you're out of alignment with God, you're in disobedience. It's as simple as that. It's whether our life is in alignment or not. Well, to present your body as a living sacrifice is a personal act of your will. You know, one thing I can't do this morning is I can't come and speak at this fellowship of believers and make you present your body as a living sacrifice. That's the one thing I can't do at all this morning, but I can do it for me. I can say, God, I avail myself. 
May your spirit work in me and through me. And may the ministry go to the body, through the body, so that we all grow up. Because we need each other. One of the things I think you need to understand is, listen, brothers and sisters, we need each other. Anybody can become a somebody, but it takes everybody to be the body of Christ. We do so much today to build church around a man or to build around a personality or to build around an individual. But God would say the body is made up of many members. Each of you have a function and your first calling as a believer is to enter into fellowship with Jesus in such a way where you present your body as a living sacrifice every single day. Isn't it interesting that the word living and sacrifice seem like they're total opposites, but yet they're the beautiful harmony of what the new covenant's all about? God wants you to sacrifice yourself so you can be fully alive. God wants you to be living a life where you decrease and he increases, where you deny yourself and you promote Christ. In fact, I love the way Paul put it in Colossians 3.3. He said this, For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When I was younger and I was uh, growing up in, I remember especially in high school, playing a lot of sports and being really interested in doing well and trying to find my identity sometimes in what I did. That was always a struggle for me. I found that I always tried to find my validity and worth and value in what I was accomplishing. And not just if I was accomplishing it, but did others notice what I was accomplishing? And, and so I realized how easy it was to promote myself or to be concerned with myself. And then all of a sudden you discover Jesus says, why don't you deny that self? And I realized the problem we run into if we want to live life for us and then live life for Jesus at the same time. The self-life has to go. And, and one of the things I realized when I was in school was I could show up at school one day and I could say, I want to hide Jesus to show Joey. Or I can decide I want to hide Joey to show Jesus. Someone's got to be hidden. Someone's got to get out of the way. And because you can't serve two masters and you also can't be two masters. So you're either mastered or you master. And the reality is very few people, everyone who thinks that they're the master of their own life is actually a slave to whatever sin and whatever object they put in front of them. Because where, the treasure, where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. Now here's what I discovered though. Every time I made it not about me and I started to just give things away and say, God, this is for you. I'm doing this for you. I surrender this at your feet. I want you to have your way. I discovered there was a joy. There was a life. There was a, a wonderful liberty that, 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 that came into my, my state of being where I realized, wow, I'm not enslaved to myself when I actually die to myself. And so a big part of our function as a church is to help each other get out of the way. So that literally God is on display, not just in one person or two people or three people, but in the whole body. And when everybody is getting out of the way and Christ is in the center of our gatherings and our meetings, it's a beautiful thing to see a community of people who are so committed and devoted to Christ. He becomes the fragrance that draws people in. 2 Corinthians 2.14 says, Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us, through us, through us, not through one of us, but through all of us, diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. See, the church is not bound to any one location. The church is the location of the living God in the midst of his people. Did you hear that? We are the location of where God is working through today. I mean, let me give you, let me put it to you this way. Do you remember when Jesus was on, his earth, on the earth in his earthly ministry? Do you remember that Jesus would go from one city to another? Like he was born in Bethlehem. He grew up in Nazareth. And then he began his ministry in the Galilee region. But wherever Jesus was, he couldn't be somewhere else. So if Jesus was over at the Jordan River getting baptized by John, he wasn't in Jerusalem. That means there was only one body on the planet earth that could be the express image of God at that particular time. And that's wherever Jesus of Nazareth was. But when Jesus was getting ready to, to leave the earth, you know what he said? He said something we all, we're all familiar with, but stop and think about it. He said, it's to your advantage that I go. For when I leave you, I'm gonna go to be with my father. 
but I'm going to not leave you orphans. I'm going to come to you. He says, I'm going to leave you my Holy Spirit, the comforter, the paraclete. He's going to guide you into the truth. He's going to be your helper. He's going to testify of me. He's going to bring to remembrance all the things that I taught you. And do you know what's amazing about that? Jesus said, greater works than these will you do. Greater works than what I've done because you guys will be not limited to one body, but you'll be a corporate body that will cover this whole planet. I mean, stop and think about this. Right now, there's a whole group of us gathered here, right here in Queens, in New York City. And yet, think about this. There are believers gathered back in Jersey, where, where I live. There's believers gathered on the West Coast and all across this country and all over the countries of the world. So here's the reality. Where is the express image of God today? Well, every believer has the Holy Spirit dwelling in them, which means that we represent Christ in all these places. The location of God's expression is not limited to the person of Jesus. It's now expanded into all the people that Jesus has made his home in. See, unless the green of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it abides alone. It would have been just Jesus forever. But because he died and rose again and put his spirit in us, we're the grain. See, Jesus came to the earth as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. But he left the earth. Are you ready? He left the earth as the firstborn among many brethren. How did that happen? Because he went to death. He joined himself to humanity so humanity could be joined to the divinity. He became a man so that we can come to the understanding of how to live and be connected to God. What an incredible mystery. The gospel is awesome because God didn't just love the world. John 3, 16 should be read this way so you can grasp the picture. For God so loved the world that he gave God. God sent God because Jesus is just as much God as the Father. So the Father God sent Son God so that when we believe in him, we will become the expression of God. Not just not perish, but if we have everlasting life, what that actually means is God's eternal abundant life will be dwelling in people and you will start to make up the reality of who he is. Your light will shine before men. They'll see your good works and glorify your father in heaven. So God sent God the son so that the son would die like a grain of wheat, reproduce, and you would not perish but have everlasting life, which is his life dwelling in you. So that it's not just that God added days to your life, but he added life to your days. Stop and think about that. God doesn't just want to add days to your life. He wants to add life, his life, into your days. So you can say, for to me, to live is Christ. And to die is gain and more gain and more glory because then I leave this body and I'm glorified with him. Do you guys remember when Jesus gave the parables in Matthew chapter 13? There were two parables specifically that I want to remind you of, because in Matthew 13, verse 44, Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Now we read these parables and often want to make it an applicational responsibility for us, rather than seeing the revelational reality that is him. Brothers and sisters, Jesus was the man who first of all went to a field and sold everything he had and literally bought that field because of the joy that was set before him when he went to the cross. And the very next parable reiterates it by talking about the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls who when he had found one pearl of great price went and sold all that he had and bought it. Should we first read this parable as what we should do? We should sell everything and see Jesus as the pearl of great price? Well, yeah, we should, but only after you first see that Jesus looks at you as the pearl of great price first. Because according to my Bible, it says we love him because he, he first loved us. That means that Jesus saw so much worth and value in us that he made us the pearl that he was willing to lay everything down for. And when he sold everything, the Bible says, that although he was rich, for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. 
When you let scripture interpret scripture, you get the picture that Jesus thinks way more highly of us than we think of him. Now that blows me away because he's creator and I'm creation. Can anybody help me out and figure out why the God who creates us is more devoted to us in this covenant than we who are the creation are to him? Isn't that unbelievable? That God created man and made us in his likeness and in his image and made us for glory. And yet in the story, we wrote our own pen. We put our own pen to it and we smudged it and we messed it up. And the Bible says in Proverbs 14, 12, there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it's, it's the way of death. We wrote death into the story. So Jesus says, okay, since you wrote death into the story, I will take death, I will come into the story, and I will undo what's been done. I will reverse the curse. I will get rid of the self. I will teach you how to live the life that I have because I will show you how valuable you are to me. I will come from the heavenlies to come down to lay it all out for you so that when you look at me, you won't just see me as creator, but you'll see me as redeemer. And for all creation, we will worship not just the creator, but the redeemer forevermore. Glory upon glory upon glory and praise upon praise, raising it up and elevating it to the point where we will just be so caught up in the very presence of God, we'll just say, does it get any better than this? And we just realize this is just the beginning of eternity. Brothers and sisters, we are so blessed if we see these things. So let's get back to this picture of the body. Do you know what God is interested in today? He's interested in you being a body where he can live through. He's interested in you being a community of people who express his love. What did Jesus say would be the mark of his true disciples? By this, they will know who are my disciples. By their, their love for one another. But then he adds to it, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another the way that I loved you. And what did I do? I, I sold everything for you. I, I laid it all out for you. I made you my prized possession. And I'm not so sure, oh Lord help us, if we even come close of loving like Jesus loved us. To make each other our prized possessions. Brothers and sisters, the reason why we have to gather together is because we can't do the Christian life on our own. The very first time God said some, something wasn't good in the Bible was that it is not good that man should be alone. You know what's crazy? There's now 7.5 or 7.6 billion people on this planet and loneliness permeates this planet. God says, it's not good that man should be alone, so I'll make a helper. He didn't just make a helper. That helper got married and made loads of other little helpers who made little helpers who reproduced, and we have 7.6 billion people on this planet, and people are still lonely. What is that saying? The problem is a vertical disconnect, not a horizontal disconnect. The problem isn't that we don't know how to do community. The problem is we don't have enough unity with the Lord who creates it. If we were rightly connected to Jesus, we would have a fellowship of believers that are rightly connected to each other. Colossians is the book that teaches about Jesus as the head of the church. Ephesians is the book that teaches about the body of, of Christ. You put those two books together and you get the picture of the one new man. Christ is the head, the church is the body. We're supposed to be so joined together that there's no separation. The vertical and the horizontal are always connected and affected by each other because it's the way God selected it to be. Remember, anybody can be a somebody, but it takes everybody to be the body of Christ. Are you with me? You catching this? Well, listen to this then. This is powerful. When you read the book of Ephesians, you discover something pretty amazing. That we all are becoming a dwelling place for God in the Spirit. We're actually becoming the body that He's working through. In fact, did you know that it actually says... In fact, I want to show you something. This is worth you seeing if you've ever seen this before. Would everybody turn to Colossians chapter 2? Hold your place in Romans 12 and look at Colossians chapter 2. This is amazing. Because in Colossians chapter 2, Paul, writing to these believers in Colossae, he, he tells them about his preeminence, the authority. Paul writes about the authority of Christ. And, and he says in Colossians 2.9, For in him, in Jesus, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In other words, God is shown through Jesus in a bodily way. And verse 10 says, And you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Now that word fullness there is the Greek word pleroma. And the word pleroma means to fill something up to completion. So Jesus is the Godhead 
filled up into completion. In other words, if you want to know what the Trinity or what the triunity of God looks like, you look at Jesus. He's the express image of God. But here's the part that blows me away and should blow you away. Do you want to know what represents the fullness of Christ today? Turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Just go back and look at Ephesians chapter 1 at the very end of the chapter and look at what you get. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, it says, And he, Jesus, put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is what? His body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So stop and think about this, everyone. If in Jesus you get the picture of the Godhead, if in Jesus he represents the fullness of the triune God, and Jesus is what you see when you want to see God, Ephesians 1 reminds us that the church is what you're supposed to see if you want to see Jesus now. It's the same Greek word pleroma here. We are the one who is the fullness of him, who fills all in all. That means, brothers and sisters, you and I are meant to be a, a bodily expression of Jesus on the earth. And if we come to church on a Sunday morning for an hour to an hour and a half, and we say hi, and we greet each other, and we leave, and we just go on with our day, and we don't really grasp this deeper concept, and we don't grasp the deeper revelation of what's the body, then you leave an everybody experience to go back to a somebody experience feeling like a nobody inexperience. And you wonder why you're lonely and disconnected. It's because you are unaffected by the revelation that brings yourself into elevation to put you in a manifestation of Christ in full explanation. It's because you don't see that you are the church supposed to be explaining to the world what the unity of the community of the triunity of God looks like. And because we don't do that, the love of Jesus isn't seen the way it's supposed to be seen. And, and the world is supposed to turn their heads and go, only God could have sent his son to accomplish such a thing. Because in John 17, it says that we should be one with him, even as he's one with the father. So that the world will know that the father sent the son. What would bring all of us together from different ages and different backgrounds and different stages in our different situations and our different occupations and our, our different explanations of life? When we come together and we go, wait a minute, we all come in agreement on Jesus? And we all discover and rediscover day after day that there's a new life in him and a new discovery to, 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 to just uncover about the greatness of who he is. See, the church is meant to be the full expression of Jesus in the way that Jesus is the full expression of the Godhead. That's enough to just pause and think and meditate and go, wow, Lord, help us to become that city on a hill. Help us, God, to be what you've called us to be. In Hebrews chapter 10, in verse 5, it says, Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. A body is what the Lord is after. A body of believers. A community that represents the fullness of him. In John 1.16, it says, And of his fullness... We have all received and grace for grace. It's only by what God has done for me that makes this possible. So now think about this. Let's go practical now. I'm giving you enough things to see in Revelation to see a spiritual picture of something. Now let's make it really practical. How do you do this? How do we become one body with many members that reflect and express Jesus on this earth like this? Well, back to Romans 12, it's going to help us. Take a look at this. In Romans chapter 12, after Paul says, present your body as a living sacrifice, which is a personal thing, but also a corporate thing, because we're supposed to do it as a body of believers together. In the end of verse 2, it says, that's how we prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. If God's will is to manifest his presence through a body, then the only way to do that is if we get out of the way to be that body that's fully yielded to him. That means we got to give space for the Holy Spirit to lead our meetings. We got to give space for the Holy Spirit to govern our lives personally and individually. And we got to give space for us to realize this. Romans 8:14 says as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. These are the sons of God. See the true believer is governed and guided 
by the Spirit in their life. If this series that we've been doing is called Living a Life uh, of the Spirit, or um, what's the exact name of it? It's Spirit-Filled Life. Spirit -filled life. To, to have a Spirit-filled life, let me tell you, is definitely a thrilled life. It's definitely an abundant life, an exciting life, but it involves a death in your life as well. It has to involve you denying yourself, taking up your cross daily, and following the Lord. And that's why verse 3 goes on to say, For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. Do you know how much it would help the church gatherings if we all came in here and said, not my will, but your will be done, one by one? Could you imagine what it would look like if we say, not my preference. God, what do you prefer today? God, what would you like us to sing? What would you like us to bring? What would you like us to do? What would you like us to know today that represents your heart for us at this time and in this season? Brothers and sisters, what would it look like if we had ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches, as the seven letters of Revelation tell us? What would it look like if we came together and said, I'm not going to think highly of me. I'm going to think soberly about my life and my preferences and my calling and my direction for a moment. And I'm going to think about what's God's calling for us. And what's God asking Roots Church to be in Queens, New York? And what's God asking us to be as a community of believers? Because, listen, brothers and sisters, although the body of Christ is big and broad all over the world, it's specific and local when it comes to your living it out. You have to have a specific church which you can do the one anotherings with. Because I can't read my New Testament and say, I'm going to just take a step back and not be a part of any local fellowship, and I'm just going to love the body of Christ the way Jesus loved me. Well, let me ask you, how close was Jesus with his disciples? Was Jesus always kind of hanging them out through like texts and emails and be like, hey, Peter, James, John, I'm out doing some stuff with the Father, but just checking in with you. I hope you're okay. And then like a text here and there and hey, maybe we'll see each other on Sunday because that's our gathering day. Peter, James, John, Andrew, Bartholomew, Thomas. No, like they live life together every day. Now, I know that's a challenge in our modern culture where we don't live in the same village. We don't live in the same community. We all drive or take the subways or trains. We go far places. We go distant places. We work and commute. But here's what I do know. Community is rooted in communion. And communion involves a union. You don't get community without communion. You don't get communion without union. It means being together is already an absolute mandatory reality. How can I grow together with people I'm not being together with? How can we be the body if I'm a body part separated from the body? If I was to take off any one of my body parts and push it aside, it dies, it looks gross, and it looks really out of place. But as long as every body part is connected to me, it looks natural, it, it flows together, and my whole body functions the way it's supposed to. Why? Because Paul says in verse 4, For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we being many are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. There's so much I could say about this. And I'm going to go for the next three hours talking about this. So here's what's going to happen. Your bum on your seat is going to get really numb and tired and it's going to fall asleep. And you know what happens if you're like laying on your, on your leg or you're putting your foot underneath your bottom? You know, you know what happens when a body part goes to sleep? You guys all know what that's like, like pins and needles? We have a lot of problems in the body of Christ today because not just one body part is asleep, but most of the body parts are asleep. We have pins and needles all through the body of Christ. And you know when you wake up and you're kind of like, oh, 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 like, oh my goodness. Hold on, just let me shake it up. We got to do this with the body of Christ. We got to shake up, but not just this part. I got to shake up this part. And I got to shake up this part. Because so much of the body of Christ is inactive. We've created a Mr. Potato Head church. Where you got a big head and little body parts. And what happens is, Jesus, who's the head of his church, wants the church to function like a full body. But to do that... You have to give attention to each other. In fact, do you know there's a verse in Paul's letter to the Corinthians that spells out how to wake up sleeping body parts? And I think the majority of church doesn't even know this passage. And if they know it, they've never stopped and meditated on it. So I'm going to make sure that's not the case for you guys. Everybody turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 for a minute. And let me just read to you a passage here that's so practical. It's so practical. you got to hear this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12... He picks up right where he leaves off in Romans 12, in a sense. It's almost like they could be completely connected in the same letter. 
It's like as if the same person wrote it by the same inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That's exactly what happened. Okay, so look at what it says in verse 12. For as the body is one, I'm in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. So how did we become unified? Because the Holy Spirit became residential in all of our lives. He made his home in you. And since the Holy Spirit's living in Jimmy and the Holy Spirit's living in Alex and the Holy Spirit's living in Jeremiah and all of us in this room, one by one, the same spirit in them is the same spirit in me and we're united by the spirit. This is why Ephesians 4.3 says, let's endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. We don't have to create unity. We have to maintain and keep the unity that Christ started. Look at what it goes on to say. Stay with me. Whether you were Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, you've all been made to drink into one spirit. Verse 14. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. We would not have a church meeting if Jimmy showed up by himself. We would have Jimmy getting alone with his father. Jimmy getting alone with God. And as a pastor of this fellowship, Jimmy is not here so he can use his gifts and all of you enjoy the giftingness that God has given to him. Jimmy is also here to use his gift and to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, so that you can use your gifts. And I've been challenged with this as a pastor. Does the church exist so that Joey as a pastor can use my gifts? Or does the church exist, or I'm sorry, does the pastor exist so the church can use their gifts? See, a, a, a shepherd, a rabbi, a teacher, an overseer, is meant to not lord it over the body, but to be servants to that body and to equip that body so the body starts to function like a body. The one way you want to actually examine the church is not by numbers. How big are we getting? How small are we getting? Were our numbers up? Were our numbers down? What about baptisms? What about this? The main thing was, is Christ growing in the body through its members? Is, are people becoming more like Jesus? Is maturity happening in the church? Are people showing up or are they growing up? Are people going to church or being the church? Are people seeing what Christ is worth or what your life is worth? Are we laying it down or are we taking everything back and saying, I can go away with this and do something with my life? See, it's always got to go back to the body. So look at what Paul says. Look how practical it gets. Look at verse 15. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Verse 17, if the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? And if the whole were the hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them in the body, just as he pleased. Are you ready for this? If you are here this morning and you're a part of this fellowship, it pleased God to call you here. And he placed you here. And he didn't just place you here, he graced you here. So that in the space while you're here, you'll do your part and do your share so that you will have a place where God's grace can manifest his face through your life. That you will be an active contributor, an active participant, a prayer warrior for this fellowship and for this community and for this lost harvest. Because the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are? Whoa. A few, but the few can be you if you make that prayer true and you pray it first. You could pray, Father, send me as a labor in your harvest. And you know what, this, you, know what you discover? When you start praying for labors in a harvest, you become one. As soon as you start praying for your harvest, you, you become a labor. Because the first way to deal with this harvest is prayer. You break up, you break up fa fallow ground. In Hosea 10, 12, it says, Sow for yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord until he comes and rains righteousness down on you. Brothers and sisters, you have a responsibility, and your response is to respond to his ability. That's your response, ability. Your response, his ability, Christ working through you, that's your responsibility. Every one of you has a role to play. Every one of you has a part. 
has a gift, has an, a contribution, an addition that makes this whole church what it is. It's your church, your community, your family. So we can't say, I'm not the eye, I'm not the ear. You say, praise God that we have an eye and an ear. And look at what it goes on to say, verse 19. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hands, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. You know, some of us think, I don't have any gifts that, that can contribute to the body. You don't know how necessary you actually are. You know, sometimes there are people serving in this church who do it behind the scenes and in ways that are not always visibly known and visibly seen. But what you do makes even what's visibly seen happen. What you do when you pray for the church makes what happens happen in the, in the realm of the Spirit and in fruitful ways because you are praying into it. Charles Spurgeon, the great London preacher, when once asked why his ministry was so effective, he took somebody down to the boiler room, you probably know this story, and down the boiler room were a whole bunch of elderly ladies who every time Spurgeon preached was praying over the gatherings. And Spurgeon said, the reason why people come and are affected is because these women are dedicated to prayer. See, what seems unnecessary is so necessary because what happens visibly has to be supported by what happens behind the scenes and out of sight. And brothers and sisters, we all have a part to play. I love uh, G. Campbell Morgan, who was the predecessor before Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones in the uh, Westminster Chapel there in, in London. And let me tell you what, what G. Campbell Morgan said when describing the church. He wrote a book called The Birth of the Church, an exposition of the second chapter of Acts. And listen to what he said. Listen carefully to this. Quote, There and then the Christian church was born, the very body of Christ, the mystical body. The multiplication of the one into 12. And the 12 into 500. And the 500 into 3,000. And the 3,000 into 5,000. I'm only taking the figures of my New Testament and then presently the great sacramental host that through more than 1,900 years has believed on him and has received this very gift of the Holy Spirit. There is the great movement, end quote. That one was becoming many, who was becoming many, who was becoming many. I'm here today because the first 12 did their share. Brothers and sisters, you cannot care more about something in your life than doing your share for the very thing that gave you life. Did you hear that? You cannot care more about something in your life without considering the life that gave you the ability to do anything at all. It's his life in you and the care for his church that's got to become the priority within your priorities. The whole reason why we schedule meetings is because we know everybody has their own time clocks doing their own life. But if we don't schedule things together, how will we know when the church is gathering? And when the church is gathering, Hebrews chapter 10 says, do not forsake the gathering together of the saints as is the manner of such, but exhort one another while it's called today and especially even more as the day approaches. See, we come together to stir each other up toward love and good works. So brothers and sisters, we have to care about all the parts of the body. Verse 23 says this, and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism or division in the body, but that the members should have the what? The same care for one another. If one member suffers, some way or another, we all have to suffer with that member. And if one member rejoices, some way or another, we've got to learn to rejoice when someone else is rejoicing. We share in each other's sufferings. We share in each other's joys. You say, Joey, which one should we be? Because in the body of Christ, you have, you have at least two of those every time. Like in other words, you always have somebody suffering and you always have somebody rejoicing. Should, should we be a, choice, a, a church that rejoices or suffers? Well, I like what Paul said. He says, I'm, I'm, I'm always sorrowful, yet I'm rejoicing. I'm rejoicing, yet I'm always sorrowful. In other words, we walk in the tension of two realities. We bur we're burdened for the lost souls that don't know Jesus. And yet we're blessed by the souls that do. 
I wake up and I'm excited to know I get to gather with the church and I'm discouraged that there's so many people out there that are waking up after a hangover after last night's party. I'm discouraged by the lack of life in one place and I'm encouraged by the promotion of life in another. And I live in the grace of two tensions. That the church is meant to be a hospital for sinners, but also a beautiful sketchboard for amazing poetry and paintings in motion where we are the workmanship of God created in Christ Jesus for good works whom God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Ephesians 2.10 says. You can't just be a hospital for sinners. You got to be a place that positions the saints as more than conquerors in Jesus Christ. Because I'm not just a sinner saved by grace. I'm a saint in a new place in the heavenly places with Christ. I can't pick and choose which one I want to be. I'm what God tells me I am. And who I am is I'm a member of one big body called the church. And we're all one body, many members. And every member matters. Every person matters. And guess what? All the unbelievers are potential members. You never write anybody off. When you see somebody that doesn't know Jesus, they're a potential member of the body of Christ. And you seek them out with a heart of a servant and you become all things to all men that you might win some because Christ already went to the cross for them and you get to make known the good news that he did. See, when Jesus died on the cross, he ran past the finish line and then passed the baton to you. So like in a relay race, it's like I'm catching it at the finish line and I'm running the victory lap. I don't run a race to win as it relates to trying to earn my salvation. I run a race from my salvation, giving the explanation to a world that there's good news. Christ died, was buried, and risen again. And if anybody believes in him, he's more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. The baton got passed to you at the finish line. Brothers and sisters, we have the greatest message. We have the greatest mission. We have the greatest master. And I want to leave you with these three final points. Very simple. May Roots Church be one in vision. And may your vision be of one, which is Christ. May your highest vision in this church be to know Jesus, to show Jesus, and to grow up in Jesus. May Christ be your all in all. May Christ be what you see. May Christ be what you live for. May Christ be what you share with this world. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said, the lamp of the body is the eye. And if the eye is good, the whole body is full of light. But if the eye is bad, then the whole body is full of darkness. And if the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Did you ever stop to think that he wasn't just talking about you as an individual, but the church as a body? And in other words, the lamp of the whole body of Christ needs to be good. We need to have a singular vision as the church. And if the vision of the church is good, the whole body becomes full of light. But if the vision is off, the whole body becomes darkness. And how great will that darkness be? There's your explanation why church is missing the mark. The vision is off. What we're looking for and living for and trying to attain is the wrong thing. Because it's something other than the someone that Jesus Christ is. We want the blessing, not the blesser. We want the gift, not the giver. We want the one who makes my life count, not the one who already made it count on the cross of Calvary. Jesus Christ is life, and that more abundantly. When we get that right, our vision will be right. Amen? Amen. That's number one. Number two, we need to be one in the way that we love together and live together. In other words, one in fellowship. Fellowship koinonia is the common life, the sharing of the common faith we have in Christ. We need to share Jesus together. Listen, it's not enough just to hang out together. We got to be able to learn that while we're together, we've got to be able to point each other to Christ and build each other up in Christ. Because being together is one thing, but sharing life together while we're being together is another thing. One can produce friendship, the other produces fellowship. I believe fellowship is higher than friendship because friendship I can have with anybody. They can share their life with me, I can share my life with them, and that's friendship. But fellowship is when we share the Christ life together, and I can only do that with believers. So when you're with believers, don't miss out on fellowship. Don't miss out on the opportunity to stir one another up toward love and good works and encourage each other in the faith. Are you with me? When somebody gives you a need, don't say, I'll pray for you. Pray for them right then and there. Put your arm around them and say, let's talk to the Lord together about this. And let's minister to each other. And then finally, third and lastly, one in vision, yes. One in fellowship, yes. Also one in mission. 
Jesus called us all to make disciples, not just a few of us. We need to be the kind of disciples that are disciple-making disciples. We need to be the kind of disciples who multiply by learning the process of death because there's no progress without the process that includes death. And we need to be the kind of people that understand unless the grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it bears much grain. And the way to attain and maintain and manifest the spiritual such as this, the reality of Christ in us, is this simple truth. If I make it about Jesus every day and I help other people to know Jesus and grow in Jesus, I'm making disciples by simply adding Jesus into the situations God's called me in. I'm helping people to learn that he's good, he's real, he's alive, he's active, and I'm sharing with them the things that I've received. Freely you receive, freely you give. Paul exhorted the believers in Philippians 1.27 that we would all strive together for the work of the gospel and that we would do that with one mind and one heart. So brothers and sisters, that's my exhortation to you today. Be the body. Stop focusing on being a somebody and start learning about the everybody who becomes the body. Focus on the fact that you can't live the Christian life without each other. You can't truly live the Christian life, I should say. Truly walk in what Christ has given you without the one anotherings, without the being togethers and the sharing of life in Jesus. So I want to pray that roots would grow into branches that bear the fruits of the Spirit in such a way where you guys would be an evident expression of Jesus in New York City. You guys would be a community of unity that reflects the triunity of God in a way that this world is so desperately needing to see. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father,